Um, so hi, everybody. Welcome to Motley Crue and Modern JavaScript. Um, I want to thank you all for coming on a Friday to talk about JavaScript. Not always the most exciting topic. I know it's been a long week and a busy conference, so thank you, everyone, for you know, coming to the second to last session. Um, this should be hopefully pretty fun. There's nothing too deep or technical in here. And some of you might be wondering why metal music and JavaScript? That doesn't really make sense. Those aren't two things that you generally will put together. Um, but I'm here to tell you otherwise. I think that there's actually a lot of similarities between the arc of metal music and the arc of JavaScript. And also, it's a lot more fun to talk about metal music than it is to talk about JavaScript. And it gives you way better slide opportunities. And uh, hopefully, it'll help you guys remember the message a little bit. So let's start with heavy metal music. And actually, 2018 is a great year to talk about this because it's the 50th anniversary of metal music. Generally speaking, there are three bands credited with creating the heavy metal sound that sort of we know today. There's Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple back in 1968. And it was a new sound back then. It was really something people hadn't heard before. And people got excited and enthusiastic about it. And it was kind of a, I hate to use the word, but, but paradigm shift. And, uh, and with all that excitement and that enthusiasm, a bunch of new bands cropped up and kept iterating on that sound. And you can see that some of these bands are, are huge, and you've heard of them. And some of them, maybe you haven't. And the key takeaway here is that even though there was a lot of enthusiasm about heavy metal, and there was a lot of bands that started, they weren't all very good. In fact, a lot of them were pretty bad. And I would argue that JavaScript follows a similar arc. So for those that have been doing JavaScript and web development for a while, uh, Prototype, Dojo, and Moo tools were kind of the first three big JavaScript frameworks that show that you could do more with JavaScript than just you know, change the status bar in the bottom left corner. And that got people excited. Just like Black Sabbath got people excited about heavy metal music, these frameworks got people excited about JavaScript. And now we have this endless proliferation of JavaScript. There's so many new frameworks all the time. How do you keep up? And so that's actually um, a big part of what this talk is about. There will probably be several new JavaScript frameworks created during the course of this talk, published to NPM, <laughs> and people will be on GitHub pages screaming about how good their framework is. But the key takeaway, and this is what you need to remember, is that not all of these JavaScript frameworks will be winners. And in fact, most of them won't be. They'll be different than what's come before, maybe. But that doesn't mean that they're better. And so one of the things that I want to talk about today is how do we evaluate a JavaScript framework? And let's look at kind of the current state of the art of JavaScript frameworks and see what's good today and how to kind of evaluate what's good tomorrow. So why should you listen to me? My name is Eric Brandis, and I lead two lives. My first life is that of an enterprise consultant. So I've worked in the belly of soul-crushing corporations for the last 13 years or so. A better part of that last 10 years was building single-page applications. So I've sort of I've written a lot of JavaScript. And I've sort of seen how it works in production and sort of what works and what doesn't. So I've got a lot of experience using most of the major frameworks that are popular today. But the other life that I lead is as the co-founder of a JavaScript company called TrackJS. We're a production error monitoring tool. So if you've got that Angular, Angular 5, I think we're up to now, soon to be Angular 6, if you've got the Angular 5 application and you think that maybe your business logic has some bugs in it, we make a great tool to tell you if that's the case. And so in that life, we get to see a different perspective. We have over a billion errors that we track every month from our customers. And what's interesting is our average customer, every other page view on their website results in a JavaScript error, which is pretty wild. Um, it, it generally correlates to the more JavaScript that you have, the more errors that you have. And so we get to see how these things fail. And what it's really taught me is that maybe we want to be careful about JavaScript. Maybe we don't want to rush headlong into the newest thing. So this concept of front-end development actually is relatively new. Um, you know, five or six years ago, you would never have seen a front-end developer role listed on a career website. But now it is. Now it's a thing. Uh, and that's, that's pretty awesome. It's pretty metal. Uh, and there's a, a resource that everyone should probably be aware of. It's called the Front End Checklist. And it's on GitHub. And uh, that's a screenshot of it on the, on the right there. And you can't see that because it's long, because it's really long. Um, the front end has become complicated. It is a lot of work to get a web application right today. So I have taken the liberty of actually taking this really long screenshot that you can't read and putting it into really long bullet point slides for you. And the start of it, I, and we're not going to go through all these. No way. That would be awful. It's Friday. Um, but I wanted to call out the JavaScript slide specifically. 
And so you can see on here there's things like concatenation and minification, right? These are best practices. These are always good ideas. And so that's cool. And actually, I mean, if this, this is the entire JavaScript section of the front end checklist. So it seems, you know, at first glance, pretty reasonable. But the front end checklist goes on, and it's got a section about the head tag. And in fact, it's got two sections about the head tag. And it's got stuff about web fonts, and it's got stuff about CSS. It's got stuff about images, right? How do you dynamically load an image? How do you handle retina displays? And you might be wondering, well, what's the point? Well, the point is that the choices that you make with your JavaScript, which framework you pick, how you choose to build your web application, that has a direct impact on all of this other stuff as well. So when you think about JavaScript, really you're thinking about the entire web application because that's what's driving it these days. One often overlooked uh, thing is accessibility. And so, I mean, if you're using Angular, it is really hard and quite a bit of work to make a really accessible website. So if that's something you care about, you know, you gotta know that when you pick these tools. Um, same with performance, right? Some of these frameworks perform better than others. And some of them are great. Whoops, some of them are great for SEO and some of them aren't. And that's just all, that dozens of bullet points. That's just for a, a bog standard front end application. And of course, Google is now pitching this new thing called progressive web apps. So it's basically a web app on steroids. It's got like a service worker component um, to kind of load things out of band. It's very focused on performance, offline capabilities, that sort of thing. So not only do you have the front end checklist, now you've got progressive web apps, right? They're basically a web app that's turned up to 11. And Google helpfully has a checklist as well. And again, I've screenshotted it for you. And so you can see that it's quite short and it's uh, pretty easy. Again, I've taken the liberty of turning it into bullet points for you. And again, we're not gonna go over all, all of this. But I did wanna talk about the last two bullet points, so hopefully you can read it, but if you can't, I'll read it for you. The last one is content doesn't jump as the page loads. So you can almost always tell a single page client rendered application on page load because things like jump in and out all over the place, right? There'll be like eight loading spinners and like the boxes get bigger and smaller. And if you're on a phone, it's just a disaster, right? Because you're trying to tap on it while it's loading and the things are moving out from under your finger and it's just awful. It's classic angular behavior actually. Um, the last bullet point on here that I want to talk about, and this just like infuriates me to no end, is that press, so this is what they want you to do. Pressing back from a detail page retains scroll position on the previous list page. That's a bullet point that in 2018, Google felt was necessary to put on the progressive web, web app checklist. And that's because we've broken the back button. Something so fundamental that's been working for over a decade, two now, we've completely broken with these client rendered applications. And even today with Angular, React, all of the new stuff, the back button is still a problem, if you can believe it. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's also really hard to do that Google wants you to do for progressive web apps. And again, depending on what JavaScript framework you choose, this stuff can be easy or it can be hard. So this talk is all about making the right JavaScript choices because if you make the wrong JavaScript choices, instead of like a super metal front end experience, it's like more of an adult contemporary kind of metal, non-metal experience. And instead of your progressive web apps being super awesome, they're super lame. <laughs> And, and by the way, so Tom Jones is a very famous Vegas singer, for those of you who don't know. I always assumed he was American. No, he's actually from the UK. So this is sort of your fault in a lot of ways. Um, and as our, our, our friend Slayer say, um, if you make the wrong JavaScript choices, hell awaits, right? And I think it's important to understand how we got here. You know, the, how did the front end become so complex and how did we get all these JavaScript frameworks that really maybe aren't helping us do our job but are very popular? And so it's one of those, um, what is the quote? Uh, history, those who don't remember history are condemned to repeat it, something like that. So I think it's important to understand sort of how did we get here? And what's really fun about this is we can, we can follow music in a similar arc, right? So if we, go, if we look at music first, you know, before there was heavy metal, there was Elvis, right? And so Elvis is sort of the creator of rock and roll, depending on you know, sort of what you believe. <laughs> um, you know, so he took, he took rhythm and blues, and, um, and country music and sort of combine them into what we wouldn't really call rock and roll today, but he was a, you know, it was a fundamental change. Along the computer timeline, we've got Tim Berners-Lee, right? I mean, this guy was a fundamental paradigm shift, right? He created the WWW and HTML as a markup language. This is a picture of the first uh, web page that was ever made. What's really funny about this 
is that this web page actually like checks a lot of the boxes on the front end checklist because it doesn't have CSS, right? It doesn't have JavaScript. It loads super fast on a 3G connection, and the back button always works, right? So, so actually, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, he was pretty good at this web thing. But music kept moving forward, right? And so the Beatles came out, and I think they're from France, maybe, or Germany. And um, but they, you know, they had a, they changed the sound game again, right? And the same thing happened when you didn't just have read-only web pages; you actually had the ability for the client to send data to the server. How many of you have actually, how many of you know how this works or have written an actual form post? Not an Ajax post, but an actual form post. Because we just hired an intern, he's 19 years old, at one of my client sites, and he didn't know that you could send data to the server without using Ajax. And it, but it makes sense, he's never seen a form post. He's never had to, right? I thought that was really interesting. And there's another band from Germany, I think, that started. Um, a few years after the Beatles, and, you know, and they kind of added more edge to that sound, right? It wasn't just that sort of bubblegum pop, it was, it was kind of a, a darker sound. And in the computer world, Brendan Eich was making JavaScript, right? He was the original language creator, and apocryphally, if you believe the story, it took him only two weeks to develop the language, and I actually tend to believe that given how it works. And that ushered in this era of what was called DHTML, which unless you've been doing web stuff for a while, you probably haven't even heard that term anymore, right? And so like, this was the best image I could find about DHTML, and it was the best because it was like, made in 1996 or something with like, Photoshop 1. So I thought that was really you know, telling of, of kind of that era. And then we get to, to Zeppelin, to the founders of, of modern metal, and we've, got, you know, we've already talked about Dojo and that stuff. But music kept moving, right? And so you know, even though Led Zeppelin is still classic, well, there was these guys in Detroit that actually thought maybe we wanted a harder sound, but also with wearing some cool costumes, right? And that sort of ushered, you know, so after, so post, post Dojo and Move Tools, we've got, we've got jQuery, right? And this was really what kind of won the browser JavaScript framework wars for a while. And music continued to get better, I guess, although the mustache on Lars there is really just something else. And same with jQuery, right? People were using jQuery not only as just like a, like a browser compatible API, but then somebody, I don't know who it was, they figured this out, right? This is actually, like, this is client rendered HTML right here, right? This is the precursor to Angular and to Backbone and to React and all of those, right? People were using jQuery to actually build things dynamically on the client, right? Like, this, is, this will make an unsorted list of different taco meat fillings, right? With, all with jQuery. And of course, because developers are developers, they would take this to the extreme, and you would see like thousand line JavaScript files with just like loads and loads of, of this just sort of unmaintainable mess. And just like music kept getting better, or at least different, so did JavaScript. And I actually blame Google a lot for a lot of what's transpired, to be honest, because this came out. And I don't know if, if any of you guys remember uh, sort of original Gmail. But it was a game changer. It was really, it felt like a desktop application. And they did it with sort of a single page application framework. They would load all the data up front for like the first 20 emails, and as you're clicking in those emails, they're just re-client rendering the page. They're not going back to the server, so it's basically instant. And a lot of developers saw Gmail and said, we should build our own Gmail. But the dangerous thing there is that they're not, I'm certainly not Google. I do not have the resources or the time to do as good of a job as they did on Gmail. But that's okay because some new frameworks came out to help us. So if some of you may have used Knockout or possibly Backbone, right? Or, or you know, Angular was really great <laughs> for a while. And that was kind of the first, the first generation of single page application frameworks that really focused on that client rendering. And now we're kind of in what I would call a second generation. And so that's kind of um, more like the Scandinavian black metal, right? Is maybe more where we're at. We've got React and Redux, we've got Angular, Next, Angular 2, Angular 5, or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's just Angular now, but boy, do they not handle that name change very well. We've also got Vue, right? So those are kind of the big three that are popular and have community engagement today. And of course, there's a million others, right? And so we've seen this slide already, but there's loads and loads of these. So imagine you're building a web application, a brand new one. What framework do you pick? So we've got a couple goals, right? We want it to load fast. We want it to have good performance once it's loaded. We want a modern user experience, so we have to use CSS, right? We can't go straight full Tim Berners-Lee on this thing. We gotta you know, actually make it look good. And we want it to be quick to develop and easy to maintain, which is kind of a nebulous concept. So 
a lot of developers at this point, when tasked with creating a new web application, say, well, we're going to use React. And you might say, why? And well, because it's cool. And I disagree with that way of picking frameworks. And so I have a different way that I pick frameworks. And so the first question I want to ask is, how dynamic is your site? All right? You may not need all of this client-rendered craziness, right? If, you, if the answer is mostly static, that's one thing. Or if it's dynamic, that's maybe a different choice. So let's say it's mostly static. You don't need a really crazy JavaScript environment to make mostly static content. You can use a static site generator, like Jekyll, for example. Jekyll was written by Tom Preston Werner, who was the CEO of GitHub. Um, and it actually is what runs GitHub pages. It has loads of good things about it. But it's, like, the important thing to note here is that it's great for a lot of use cases that maybe people don't think about. Blogs, marketing sites, um, you know, documentation for things. Um, even, like, even sort of content-heavy sites, I look at it as there's a lot of clients where in order to change the content on a site, we have to do a release. right? It's not database driven. And if you're in a situation like that, if you have to do a release to change the content, well, you might as well use a static site generator, right? And then just FTP those HTML files right up there. So I think Jekyll's pretty great. It's a little long in the tooth now. So of course, the, the new hot thing, right, is, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to say this with a, a straight face, is a uh, React static site generator called Gatsby. So you use a single page application framework to generate static HTML, which I'm not sure how I feel about that, but it's, but it's really popular right now, so I feel like I have to at least talk about it. Um, the React documentation site is actually built with it, along with uh, a bunch of other very hip and cool websites, which you'll notice is actually in the pros and the cons column. Like Sometimes that's great because the community cares and can move things forward, uh, but sometimes that's not the best thing. So if you can use a static site generator, I think you should. I think it's a great solution to a lot of problems, and people don't consider them often enough. But I will be the first to admit it's not the solution to, to a fair number of things. So if, if the answer to the question of you know, how dynamic is your site is, is this really dynamic, um, the next question I think that you should ask is, do you go to the server every time a user clicks something? So if I click on a link, say I've, you know, you've got the classic master details layout pattern, and I click on a, a link to go to the details, do you go and make an API call and get back a big JSON blob? Because if you go to the server every time a user does something, I've got great news for you. You don't actually need React or Angular or any of that stuff. You're already paying the network tax to go to the server. So instead of sending back JSON, why don't you send back XML? And you might think that's dumb. And that's what AJAX actually stands for, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And when it first came out, people really did return XML from their APIs. Microsoft, actually, for those that didn't know, Microsoft is the reason we have AJAX. They created the first ActiveX control for XML HTTP requests to handle Outlook web application back in the day. Um, but the cool thing is, and the reason I'm advocating returning XML, and this is kind of a lie, but it lets me do this next slide, is what I really mean by returning XML is HTML. You don't need to return a JSON payload that you run through a really heavyweight, you know, sort of JavaScript pipeline. You can just return HTML from your server and then render it. And this is about the fastest thing that a browser can do. So there's been all these performance improvements, and people have spent thousands of, of hours trying to get these single page application frameworks to work well, when what they could have done is just generated a big HTML string on the server and just jammed it into the body, right? Lightning fast. And you might be asking, well, that sounds great, but like, I don't want to roll this myself. And the great news is, is you don't have to. You can use a framework called PJAX. PJAX actually was written by the current CEO of GitHub. And it's actually what powers github.com. Um, and the way it works is pretty simple. And PJAX, by the way, I hope you can read that maybe, stands for push state plus AJAX. So what it does is when you click on a link, it will make an AJAX get request to the server and expect HTML back from that endpoint. It will then plop that HTML into a container and then update the URL. So you get what appears to be a single page application. right? You're not doing a full page load. But it's, it's even faster, actually, because it's just rendering HTML. So if we look at it, so I'm on the jQuery PJAX site. And because GitHub is actually written with PJAX in mind, we can actually just inspect it and see what's going on. So this is actually just a quick you know, Chrome inspection of that page that you were just looking at. You can see in green is the head tag. And so this is where you know, GitHub puts the CSS and a few other things. In the blue box at the bottom is all their big script bundle. Because even if you server render, you still need you know, some script. 
And the big red box in the middle is the important thing. That's the PJAX container. That's the part that gets replaced when you go to the server. So we can actually look at the Chrome developer tools, and we can see it's making an XHR request to that endpoint, and the stuff that comes back is HTML. There's not a big JSON payload, but if we look at the HTML that comes back, it's also not a full page load. We're not paying to reload all those scripts. We're not paying to reload that CSS. We're just taking the new HTML content and plopping it in that red box, and it works really fast. And actually, uh, TrackJS, my company, is written, the UI is written entirely in PJAX as well, and it really makes it feel like a desktop application, and a good desktop application, too, not like Electron-based. Oh, I'm just kidding. Um, and you can see, in the case of GitHub, right, it's really fast. It took 238 milliseconds to get that HTML from the server, but that's it. There's no deserialization penalty. There's no big JavaScript engine that needs to go through. There's no like DOM manipulation that has to happen. It's just done. The browser just renders it. So there's loads of, of pros about PJX. One of my favorites is actually the back button still works. So that's cool. So you know we've kind of kept 1993 alive. You get real permalinks, um, and you keep the rendering on your server, which is also faster probably than some of these clients. The only real downside to PJX is that it's done. They're not really adding any new features to it. If it works for you, it'll work for the foreseeable future. If it doesn't, yeah, you might need something else because they're not really enhancing it any further. And you might think, well, I've never heard of PJX, which, by the way, it does have 15,000 stars. So it's not as many as React, but it's still, you know, it's not nothing. Um, but I hope I can convince you to at least look at it. So um, Adi Osmani released a, a blog post called The Cost of JS, and it's a really great blog post. So if you just Google The Cost of JS, you'll find it. Um, and he goes through all of the, the issues with having these huge script bundles that we try and load today. And so he's, his TLDR is, you know, basically we want less code, because less code is less to parse and compile, it's less to transfer, it's less to decompress, right? And then he has some ideas for you on how you can achieve less code. And, and these are some good ideas. I mean, scope hoisting, code splitting, tree shaking. You know, these are they're good ideas and they work. But I've got an even better idea. You can just avoid all that nonsense if you just server render and Ajax it in, right? And so uh, another group that I think sometimes gets ahead of themselves is the Netflix UI folks. And they were really, really excited about React when it first came out. And they, you know, made a big deal about we just did our homepage in React. And it always surprised me how much time they spent on that homepage, because it's one of the simplest UIs you can imagine, right? Um, but just a couple weeks ago, they said, hey, we removed all of the client-side React from our homepage, and we saw a 50% performance improvement. Like, imagine that. We just render on the server, right? And if you don't want to use PJAX, you have some other options. You can use TurboLinks. So for years, TurboLinks was Rails only, right? It was created by the Rails team. But just recently, or, well, semi-recently, they've created an NPM package. So you can, if you're in a JavaScript, type ecosystem node, you can actually use TurboLinks as well. And there's a new JavaScript framework that just came out, like I think a month ago, and it's from the people at 37signals, so it's you know, not completely without merit. And its whole job is to do just slight augmentation of your page. So rather than do client rendering, Stimulus does not want to do client rendering. It just wants to do sort of client interactivity helping, hiding and showing things, limited data binding, but certainly not full rendering of a page. So if we go back to the question, do you go to the server every time a user clicks something? And if you say, no, I don't, because I'm building Gmail too, I say, fine. That's cool. Build your, your single page application, right? But there are costs associated with single page applications. In a lot of ways, I think that single page applications are kind of the insane clown posse of JavaScript, right? It's sort of this unholy alliance between wrap and metal, right? And it doesn't really necessarily always work. So what kind of costs am I talking about? Well, for one thing, there's the routing and navigation costs, right? We've already touched on this a little bit. The back button, it still doesn't work. And deep linking is actually really painful. Mm. But you've also got render jitter. Um, you've always got you know, some sort of big build tool chain complexity to get all this stuff built and transpiled and sort of deployed. So you have a lot of dev time friction. So if you do want to build a single page application, that's fine. But I think people just need to realize that there are costs to it. And because it's Friday, and it's the afternoon, and people are tired, I'm just going to give you the TLDR right here at the beginning. We're going to talk more about these frameworks in just a second. But in my opinion, if you are going to pick a single page application framework today in 2018, I would go with React. And we'll talk about why. 
in the second place, I would go with Vue. I would do Angular third. And then I've got a special slide for Polymer. And the reason I have a special slide for Polymer, if you haven't heard of it, don't look it up. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you have heard of it, don't use it. Um, so I'm, I'm really surprised, actually, that it's, it's, it's sort of still being evangelized because it doesn't actually solve any problems that anyone actually has. Um, it, does use, it does use web components, which is a spec that Google unilaterally sort of foisted on the world, despite objections from Mozilla. Uh, but, it's, but, but it turns out that maybe those objections were valid because web components actually don't really help you build your app any faster. They don't really help you get to market quicker. They don't save you any money. So I'm not really sure why people are so excited about them. And because they're not widely supported yet, you've got all these polyfills and other things that Polymer does to try and make it work. And the one thing that Polymer doesn't really focus on, and I think is the critical linchpin of a lot of these applications, is state management. And we'll talk a lot more about that in a second. But all of these frameworks, Vue, Angular, React, in, in, in all cases, everything is a component. So um, a component really is kind of a nebulous concept these days. Um, and they've all sort of taken that as the abstraction that we want to use to build our UIs. And they say that everything's a component, and it's great because there's use, reusability, right? If I've got a, I don't know, if I've got a button component, I can just slap that button component all over my site. And in theory, that sounds good. But in practice, actually, the amount of reuse you're going to get out of a lot of these components is almost nil. Because in a lot of cases, the component that you want, you know, you try and place it on your next page, maybe it doesn't work quite the same way. And so what you end up with in practice, at least in my experience, is a proliferation of these components that all maybe sort of do the same thing, but you couldn't quite combine that logic because the business maybe didn't want it that way. The other thing that people really love about components is the isolation. They say, well, this is an isolated sort of atomic thing, and you only have to think about just the component itself and its little piece of the UI. And at first, that seems right, but it's, but it's not because the component doesn't live by itself. It lives within a broader application. And so how, you know, if I change component A, if I click on the button in component A, but component B needs to know that, how does that work, right? Isolation does not help me there. And so then you run into problems with state management, right? It gets very complicated to, to use or to play like that guitar. And so state management is actually one of the, the things I really want to focus a little time on here. Because I think state management is one of the things that a lot of these frameworks don't think about very deeply. Back in the day, this was your pretty classic web stack. You had a browser, you had the web server, which is that thing with the world on it, and then you had a database, right? Really simple. And then you know, e-commerce started and other things, and people wanted to have some session data, some, some sort of you know, per user state, along with the canonical store in the database. And then people said, well, databases can be slow, so we really want like a level two cache for some of this stuff too. So now we've got our state sort of spread around three different places. And then people said, well, that database is cool, but like 10 microservices would be even cooler. And uh, separating our services by unreliable network boundaries is going to really make things better. And so now our state actually lives in, you know, I don't know, seven or eight places. And with these client-side applications, now we've actually got our state in a brand new place, right? So we've already had all these trials and tribulations dealing with the state on the server. Well, now we've got to deal with it on the client too. And a lot of these frameworks don't really take that into account. So I've devised a trademarked test called the shopping cart test. And it's a good way to evaluate, I think, the effectiveness of a JavaScript framework. So this is, uh, I don't, do you have Amazon in the UK? Is that, like, is that a thing? Um, I assumed, I assumed, I just, I never know. Um, so this is Amazon's shopping cart page, right? And this is like a classic e-commerce experience. This is one of the simplest sort of web application paradigms that you can imagine. And so in the world of components, Right? Maybe we start chunking this apart. We've got, we've got the header with the search bar, and then we've got you know, the shopping cart itself. We've got a proceed to checkout button. That's cool. And those components are pretty big, so we want to kind of keep breaking those down. Right? That's, that's the advantage of components is we can kind of get these small, isolated, reusable chunks. So we start breaking down further, and we keep breaking it down. Right? And that seems great. We've got this kind of component hierarchy. Right? It's components all the way down, you might say. <coughs> But there's a problem with the component abstraction. So if you look at those red boxes, and I'll remove the, uh, the component outline. If you look at those red boxes, if I click on that delete button, or if I change the quantity, or if I add that item at the bottom right corner to the cart, a bunch of things on the page need to change, right? My subtotals need to change. If I've 
added something to the cart. The upper right hand icon needs to change. I need to have, you know, it needs to say two, right? And it seems like that should be really easy, but it turns out it's not. So let's talk about how Angular handles the shopping cart test. If you've never seen Angular before, this is straight from the Angular docs. This is an Angular component. The way that Angular originally decided that it wanted to handle state management was with inputs and outputs. So if you've got a parent-child component relationship, the parent component can pass data as inputs to the child, and the child can fire events when somebody you know, clicks on the button inside of it or something that the parent can listen to. And that makes a lot of sense intuitively, right? I mean, if I've got a child component, I want to give it things, and I want to know when things happen in it. And so that seems like a good idea. So, and actually, so this, so this is a very simple component. Um, it takes a name, and then it's got kind of this on-voted event. So when I click this button, it's going to fire this event. So this is the child component in this scenario. And here is the parent component. And so you can see that the name and the on-voted things are underlined in red, and that's kind of it interacting with the child component. Now, there's a couple things I want to call out here. Uh, one, and at least in the case of Angular, you're doing it inside of a string template. And so you've actually got a lot of risk here. If you wire this up wrong, if you have a, a typo or something, you usually don't find out until runtime. And they're starting to change that. They're starting to do ahead of time compilation and a few things. So it's, it's hopefully going to get better. But a string template is really not the best place to be doing this wiring. The other thing you'll notice is that it's kind of a weird syntax. That ng4, that star up there, is kind of an odd, an odd thing. So it's not actually real markup. It's the special Angular markup that only Angular can understand. But so you've got these inputs and these outputs. How do they work as far as the shopping cart test goes? So if I, say I change the quantity of something, how do I get it to update the subtotals, right? So we've got our component hierarchy, and so we, say we've got the quantity drop down. He needs to fire an event up to his parent. His parent, probably not the top app component, says, okay, I'll fire that up as well, until it gets up to wherever it needs to go. And then it has to plummet all the way back down. So you actually do get an awful lot of plumbing, an awful lot of boilerplate, and an awful lot of situations where like, you could really screw this up and like, you're not gonna know till runtime. And so plumbing's not, not great and nobody likes it. And the Angular people recognized that and they said, okay, so this is, this is the, the basics. For simple apps, you use inputs, outputs. The community has now come up with a, a global state container for Angular. And so you'll actually see this global state thing is actually really common across all of these new JavaScript frameworks. It's how they all sort of work and manage the state thing. But NGRX is one of the last ones on the market. It was patterned after Redux, which we'll talk about in a second. But the downside of it is that everything is an observable. And so you've got kind of this, this global state bag that gives you back observables that you can subscribe to for when things change. And I will say, just beware observables. Um, they sounded good at first, kind of like Limp Biscuit did maybe in the 2000s. But I think as time has gone on, it's, 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 it's harder to make a case for observables and using them. Um, and, and the reason is because they're a collection of items over time. Right? The minute you add time to any sort of equation, things get more challenging, things get more risky. The other thing is, is you've got hot versus cold observables. So an observable is hot if it starts pushing out data when the app wakes up. An observable is cold if it only starts producing data when you subscribe to it. The problem is you don't know which one you're dealing with until you subscribe to it. There's no pattern, there's no flag that you can check, there's no way to know. The other problem is that there's finite versus infinite observables. You don't actually know if the observable that you've subscribed to is ever gonna stop sending you data. And sometimes that doesn't matter, but sometimes if you've got more than one observable that you're trying to flatten together, if you pick the wrong flattening strategy and you're dealing with infinite observables, your app's just gonna hang forever. And so there's a lot of risk with these observables. And the other thing is, is about two years ago, async await support became more widely supported in Babel and TypeScript, but it only works with promises. So if you wanna use observables, you can, but you're still gonna deal with callbacks. There's no syntactic sugar to really help you um, like there is async await for promises. And I'm not saying that promises are the best. They have their own problems. But like, you know, I would just be very leery of observables. Um, plus, people get really excited to chain things together with observables. And so you get these like just crazy logic chains that are very hard to debug. 
And there's a whole bunch of other good reasons to avoid Angular. Uh, for one thing, the unit testing story is very difficult. It is almost impossible to write a component test in Angular without Angular CLI. Like if you try and spin it up yourself, can't be done. Angular CLI makes it easier, but Angular CLI doesn't work with all applications, especially if you've got like a hybrid Angular JS Angular application, it's not gonna work great. Forms are complicated. Performance isn't very good in the default case unless you, use, you change the uh, detect, change detection strategy. Um, and the upgrade trend mill is just ruthless. Um, so for example, uh, between Angular 4 and 5, they deprecated the HTTP client that they had created in favor of a different one. So as of 6, you actually have to throw away all of your old AJAX calls and use the new client, which I'm like, you guys, they had that chance to make that change between Angular 1 and Angular 2. Why are we doing it between Angular 4 and 5? Right? It doesn't make any sense. So anyways, my recommendation is don't use Angular. So what about Vue? Right? So Vue is actually... Um, one of the newer frameworks on the block. It's got a lot of community support. People are really liking it. And the, kind of the rub on it, or the, the TLDR on view, is that it's a lightweight Angular, sort of what Angular 2 should have been, is what some people have said. And just like Angular 2, you compose with components. Everyone's really excited about components. And so they've actually got a really, their component hierarchy is a lot better looking than mine, actually. Um, and they've got the same thing as Angular. They've got inputs, right? They've got kind of their own data binding syntax. And they've got outputs. And as we just talked about, that doesn't work great for big applications. So how do we get the events from the bottom of the hierarchy to the top, right? If we go back to our shopping cart example, I changed the quantity. It's the same story we had in Angular 2. We have a lot of plumbing ahead of us. but. The Vue community actually was realizing this problem as well, and they created a thing called Vuex. And Vuex is a lightweight global state container, just like NGRX. The big difference is that it doesn't use observables, which makes it a lot easier to sort of reason about and deal with. So essentially, when a component makes a change, it fires an action, the store listens for that action, the store updates itself based on that action, and then it triggers updates to the rest of the UI. And in practice, that works pretty good. Overall, Vue is simpler than Angular, it's got a decent global state container, it's lightweight, and it mostly has good performance. Really, in general, um, it's, it's, it's a pretty good alternative to Angular. The big downside is it still uses string-based templates. So you've still got these situations where you can wire things up incorrectly and you don't know until runtime. And again, the tooling is always improving, but it's something to think about. So finally, we get to React, right? So this is the one that I think is, is potentially the most interesting, and that if, if someone, if it was my money, if I was gonna pay someone to build a single page application with my own money, which I don't know if I'd do, but if I, if I did, I would say, hey, you have to use React. Um, and the cool thing about React is that, and it was, you know, this is kind of prevalent now, but it was the first one that had what was called a virtual DOM. And I, I, when I first read the white paper on React and why this was interesting, I was really excited because what I've always wanted to do is just repaint the whole page like you can with server rendering. If I click a button, if I change the quantity dropdown, I don't wanna like figure out which pieces to change, I just wanna repaint the entire page. Up until React, it was too slow to do that. And so that's why Angular had change tracking, right? Dirty checking, that kind of thing. But with React, what it did was a virtual DOM. So rather than have the actual DOM, it would keep an in-memory in representation of the DOM, and when something happened, you would send it, hey, here's the new DOM that I think you should build. And it would do a diff on that DOM. It would only update the UI elements that actually needed, which was pretty cool. The other thing that the React folks came out with right out of the gate was the Flux architecture. And so, you know, they don't really talk about Flux anymore, um, but it was this unidirectional data flow of, you know, the component fires an action, the action is listened to in the store, the store updates itself and publishes updates, right? It's this easy flow to sort of reason about. And these days, that's all done with Redux. So you don't even need to think. It's sort of the de facto state container in the React world. There's loads of documentation. It's really simple to understand for the most part. Um, and it takes a lot of the pages out of the functional playbook. So, that, you know, the functional programmer people, they're always against mutable state. They don't want you to be able to just like change state willy-nilly. They want you to pass data into a function and have the function return you know, some sort of immutable value. And that's basically what Redux does. It uses the concept called reducers, which are basically just functions that take inputs and give immutable outputs. So in the case of the shopping cart test in React, it's really easy. 
You change the quantity button, right? You just repaint the whole page. And React is smart enough to do that diff for you and make it performant to boot. You get a few other advantages with React, in my opinion. One of those is JSX. Now, JSX is super polarizing. Some people really think this is like the worst thing that's ever happened. But I think it's cool because the other alternative is string-based templates. And so with JSX, um, this is a JSX example. But this is a JavaScript file. So even though it looks like we're writing HTML, we're really not. We're, behind the scenes, the transpiler is actually converting this to API calls. And what's cool about this is that we can actually use JavaScript functions right inside of our templates. And what's even cooler about that is the tooling knows if that function exists or not. And you get great development time, IntelliSense and VS Code, or whatever IDE you choose to use. And so this is actually a React component. And it, it sort of looks weird. It looks like HTML, kind of, right? But it's actually JavaScript. But as a user, once you kind of get used to this intermingling of, of JSX and sort of JavaScript, it actually works pretty good. And you kind of wonder why everyone was so excited about separating the templates from the logic all those years ago. So there's loads of pros to React, but the other one I want to call out is that React has a server rendering strategy. It actually, from, I don't know if it was day one, but it said, hey, you'll get better performance if you server render and then kind of wake up the interactivity part of your app. So React has a server rendering story, which is great for websites that need SEO. It's got a great community. It's got a really cool uh, app called Create React App which is like a kind of a bootstrapper. You can just sort of like initialize a React application real quick with all the settings and stuff. Um, it has great unit test tooling, actually, for the most part. Um, and one of my favorite things about the React team is that they have a commitment to backwards compatibility. I think they're on version 16 or 17 now, and they haven't done any major breaking changes. There's been a few, but they always document them really well. They always deprecate them for a long period of time, and they always give you an upgrade path. And so I think that's... You know, as a developer that wants something to be maintainable long term, I think that's, that's pretty huge. But there's even more that I like about React. And these days, everybody wants a mobile companion app, right? So React has React Native. So if you want to build your web app with one tool set, and you want to build your mobile app with the same tool set, you can. And so it's not, it's not, you know, it's not like you're using divs and spans in React Native. You're using sort of iOS or Android specific <coughs> components but it's the same tooling. And if you've ever had to deal with like Xamarin Forms um, or one of those other sort of cross-platform libraries, the React development time story is much better. Um, it's much easier on the developer. And you can use TypeScript now. So if you like types like I do, I really like types, you can use that as a first-class citizen inside React. So there's, there's not only JSX, there's TSX. And so then, in, you know, people have released all the typings files and everything for React. So you really get a lot of great compile time support with React now, too, if you want it. And I think that's pretty metal. Um, so in closing, right, your end users don't care what JavaScript framework you use, right? They only care if it makes your site work badly. So as long as your user experience is good, server render it if you can, or use static site generator or whatever. It doesn't matter. People don't care. Prefer server rendering. And if you can't server render, prefer a framework that has a server rendering story. Make sure that there's some way that if you need SEO or you need performance or accessibility that you can actually render from the server. It solves so many headaches. And what we see time and again is that the more JavaScript that you have, the more problems you're going to have. I, I wanted to make a slide that was like, you know, more money, more problems, but like more JavaScript, more problems. But that didn't fit the metal vibe, so I, I left it out. But less JavaScript is always better. And you should use frameworks that, you, that have first-class solutions for state management. So if you've got this UI, and when you click over here, you need over here to update, you're going to need a state management solution. And so if the framework that you're using has one from the start, that's really great. And at the end of the day, frameworks should make your life easier. So don't use Angular. Um, but ultimately, I guess my point is that we're making websites, we're not launching rockets, and that some of these things are ultimately a little bit more complexity than we need. And finally, to end it, I did a, a Google search, actually, for what is the most metal thing. I think I just Googled the most metal thing. And at that point, Google knew, because I'd been really on Google Images a lot, looking at 80s metal stuff. It knew that I was, when I said metal, I meant heavy metal. This is the lead singer of a Norwegian black metal band who always performs wearing that owl headdress. And I thought that was, in fact, pretty metal. <laughs>
So that is all I've got. Um, I generally uh, prefer to do, like, if you've got questions, uh, just come talk to me after this. Um, just like, I'll be over here on the side or whatever. Uh, or if you want to yell at me and tell me that um, my views on Angular are heretical and that I'm a big jerk, that's cool too. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. <laughs>